I'm now going to move on to Appendix B of the textbook. And this is a chapter that discusses the basics of digital design, circuits, truth tables, and those kinds of things. And this is kind of vital knowledge before we can start discussing the actual structures that go into microprocess, right? So it's important to know how a transistor works, how circuits work, and that's the reason behind the subsequent discussion. So let's just start with the basics. We, of course, know that in microprocess circuits, there are two voltage levels, the high and the low, and this is used to discriminate between the binary bit 1 and the binary bit 0. Right? And that's the basis for all of the binary arithmetic and the logic that, that we perform. What I'm showing you over here is the basic building block, the transistor, which is a three-terminal device, and this is an example of an NPN transistor. And you'll see how it basically operates. Right? So this transistor over here has three terminals, and depending on the input voltage that I provide to this terminal, the transistor is either in conducting state or non-conducting state. So when I give a high voltage over here, the transistor moves to a conducting state. And so current basically moves from this high voltage down to ground. As a result of that current flow, most of the voltage gets dissipated across this resistor over here. And this transistor acts like a short circuit wire. That means that if I were to sample the voltage at this point, I'm basically sampling the voltage at ground. So the output voltage here is zero, right? So this is my output voltage. And this voltage here is my input voltage. In the opposite scenario, if my input voltage is a zero, then it means that the transistor is not conducting. So there is no current flowing through the transistor and it's essentially an open circuit. So if I'm measuring my output at this point, what I'm essentially doing is sampling the voltage over here, which is nothing but the high voltage V. So you'll see that this single transistor can essentially implement an inverter logic or an inverter circuit. Whatever input voltage I give over here, the exact opposite voltage is seen at the output, right? When I give an input voltage of zero, I see an output voltage of V and vice versa, right? So this single transistor implements an inverter circuit and I can use you know, multiple transistors to also implement AND and OR circuits. Now, a single microprocessor is composed of a whole bunch of circuits. You, know, you can view them as single black boxes. Each of these black boxes can be referred to as a logic block. That is, it takes a certain number of binary inputs, it performs various operations on these binary inputs, and then it finally produces a set of binary outputs. Now, if this single logic block over here if the outputs of that logic block are purely a function of the inputs, then it's referred to as a combinational logic block. But if a separate logic block over here also keeps track of some state, right? If it has some memory saying that, you know, in the recent past I saw, you know, X, Y, and Z, I'm going to remember that state. And when I receive inputs, I'm going to combine these inputs with my state to produce my outputs. If that's what happens, then that logic block is referred to as a sequential circuit. Okay, so the outputs are a function of the inputs in this current cycle, as well as what that circuit has seen in the recent past. In a combinational circuit, the output is only a function of the inputs that that circuit is seeing in this current cycle. Okay, so for the rest of today's discussion, I'm just going to focus on combinational circuits. And at some point, I will make the switch and start discussing sequential circuits as well. So the most basic logic block is termed as a gate, and example gates are AND gates, OR gates, and NOT gates. And you can combine these gates to produce much more interesting circuits, right? So before we are done, you will see how to implement an adder using these basic gates. So when you come up with a logical circuit, you can also write a truth table that describes how that circuit behaves. So that circuit is essentially going to indicate the particular set of inputs that lead to the outputs being high or low. Okay, so if I am trying to describe a circuit which has three inputs A, B, and C, and an output E, which is true only if exactly two of the inputs are true, then my truth table is going to look like this. Okay, so here's an example where two of the inputs are true or high, and exactly two, right? So the third one is low and two of them are high. In that case, my output is one. And then similarly, if A and C are high, then my output is 1. If A and B are high, then again my output is 1. Right? But if all three are high, then my output is 0, because I need exactly two of my inputs to be true. So this is the truth table that describes this particular circuit. To make it a little less cumbersome, you can only represent the cases that are 
only high or you can only represent the cases that are only low. In this case, with three inputs, there are two to the power three different cases that you have to list. Now let's talk about Boolean algebra. So we said that there are these different gates, OR gates, AND gates, and NOT gates. They have the symbols, you know, plus, dot, and a bar above the number. So if I want to say that a logic block is implementing the OR logic, you basically say that the output X is A or B. That means X is true only if at least one of A or B is true. And then similarly, X is true if both A and B are true. That's the AND gate. And with the NOT gate, it's nothing but an inverter. That means whatever input I provide, whatever input A I provide, my output X is going to be the exact opposite value. Based on those basic operators, here are a bunch of Boolean algebra rules, right? So this is very similar to the normal algebra rules that, that we are used to. But you'll see that there are a few cases where you know things are perhaps a little less intuitive. So the identity law states that A or with a low voltage or a low input is going to be A itself. And likewise, A ended with logic 1 is going to be A itself. Then you have the converse of the, those two laws, which says that A or with 1, with logic 1, is going to be 1 itself. And A ended with logic 0 is going to be 0. A ended with its inverse is always going to be 0 because one of these is bound to be 0. And A or with the inverse of A is bound to be 1 because one of them is bound to be 1, right? So this is a very straightforward corollary from the above law over here. So the logic operators we've seen so far are also commutative. That means A or B is nothing but B or A. And likewise, A and B is nothing but B and A. These operators are also associative. That means it doesn't really matter in which order you perform the operations. So if you're doing an OR of three terms, you can do the OR of B plus C and then OR that result with A. Or you can take the OR of A and B and OR that result with C. And then similarly for the AND operator as well. Then here's the distributive law, which is very similar to normal linear algebra. So A ANDed with B or C is A and B or with the result of A and C. This one is a little less intuitive because it doesn't have an equivalent in linear algebra. But just as the AND operator is distributive, even the OR operator is distributive. So this term over here becomes A or B ANDed with A or C.